Certainly. All right, serial numbers 12, 13, 12, 20. And your name is? Peter Austin. And your unit served in? I, I served in 1st Headquarters, 1st Battalion of the 85th, and then later uh, the G3 section of Division Headquarters. And what years did you serve in the 10th Mountain Division? Oh boy. From what, 1943, 44, 45? Yeah, it's like, uh, a little over three years. Mm -hmm. And the highest rank? Sergeant. And what did it, as a sergeant, tell me a little bit about what you did. Well, my job was division operations sergeant, which uh, in Texas meant that I was responsible for every unit in the division being trained in every uh, uh, every field and phase that uh, the division commander wanted. Uh, that was that was part of the G3 uh, and, uh, of op train, plans, training, and operation is what uh, G3 is, okay? And so uh, it was my responsibility to work with the battalion S3s and to see to it that they all were on a range and, and completed their, their training. In combat, I had a multitude of duties. There were just any number of things. One of the things every night I had to write a sitrep, which is a, the situation report um, of what had happened that day to the d division. And uh, we would get a flow of information from uh, all the battalion and regimental S3s and we'd have to consolidate this information and write it up for the division sitrep. That was just w one of my jobs. And interestingly in combat, I had a multitude of jobs. You know, as an example, when when we the division was going so fast that we ran out of maps, which uh, believe it or not, you never thought we would do. Um, but we had to quickly uh, call Fifth Army, and they sent an, a little airplane up with aerial photographs. And unfortunately, they dropped the photographs behind the German lines, and it was my responsibility to go get them and. Uh, uh, that was the sort of thing that uh, one of the one of the kinds of things that uh, that I had to do. Just a multitude of uh, of duties, um, and no specific thing other than writing the sit trip. When you think about all the sit trips that you've that you've uh, written, can you think of share a couple that really stood out to you as extraordinary? No, because. Uh, these would be done when I was so tired I could hardly think and uh, and I just just do them by rote and, and get them out get them to the uh, fellows who uh, operated a, a mimeograph machine and they would mimeograph them get them out to the regiments and the battalions so I, I really don't remember any specific ones Abby uh, well, if you take yourself back 60 years can you think about a memorable uh, battle I can. I have a very memorable war-related experience. It was the day after the fighting had stopped, and I went with uh, General Ruffner's party to Bolzano, 50 miles behind the German lines, because General Ruffner had to go up and uh, apparently try to arrange some surrender terms. Uh, they they had re they had gotten a ceasefire, but uh, there was no official surrender. You see and General Ruffner's responsibility was to go up there. Well, when we get, got up there, of course, we, we went by Jeep and, and by car, and, uh, and uh, there were thousands and thousands of armed Germans all around, and it was, you know, it was kind of harrowing. We didn't know for sure that they'd all gotten the message to, <laughs> to stop fighting. And uh, um, when we got there, one memorable thing was watching General Ruffner get out of his car, staff car, and walk through this phalanx of high, high-ranking uh, uh, German generals, and they were all standing there stiffly at attention, giving him the Hitler salute. General Ruffner didn't look left nor right, nor did he return any salutes. He, he always walked with his head up in the air like that. <laughs> Anyhow, and he just stalked past those people right into the uh, into the high German headquarters. It was just like a movie, absolutely like seeing a, a World War II movie, and we, only we were there, you know. <laughs> and <clears throat> so um, we were there for quite a while, and then somebody came to me and said, Sergeant Austin, you've got to take a message back to Riva, to to the our our headquarters here, uh, because. 
we were too far out of radio range in the, for the equipment we had in those years. And I said, well, how am I going to do it? And they said, we'll, we'll get some, something or other. So they found some, um, um, I guess, OSS people had been up in the mountains, and they had a, had a Jeep, and they'd been, you know, doing all undercover work up there and so forth, and they had this really beat-up Jeep. You never saw such a beat-up Jeep in the world. So they confiscated that from those people, and then some of the lower-ranking officers and some MPs came over and gave me submachine guns and all anything they could think of, so I'd have some weaponry with me besides my own carbine, and, uh, and, and gave me this message from General Ruffner to get back to General Hayes. And... Uh, so I, start, I started back and all by myself, and I'll tell you, I was one scared 22-year-old sergeant because there were just thousands of Germans all over the roads, and we had to, I had to drive through them, and, and uh, uh, I was singing at the top of my lungs to keep my courage up, and the, uh, and the Germans, some of them would smile at me and so forth and wave, and I, you know, waved back. So at any rate, I got down to the map I had was just something some people had tried to sketch out and uh, and, uh, and I made a wrong turn and I got in this little bit of a wonderful mountain village and had a flat tire yeah and I you know I was a I had had a jeep driver's license so I knew how to attend to a jeep but unfortunately the jeep had no tools no nothing and uh, and here I was in this village and it was completely deserted and I I really didn't know what to do, and so I stood there for a minute, and a little a window open, or shutter open, and the little boy's head stuck out. So I yelled at him, Americano, <laughs> and how oh, that did it, the whole village came to life, and out they came, and uh, you know, the, that was a signal to them that, my golly, maybe this war was really over with, and so the whole village came pouring out and wanted to have a party, naturally, right there. Being Italians, they thought this would be a marvelous occasion for a, a, a wonderful party. Well, unfortunately, I had to get this message back. And so I explained to them, but I showed them my flat tire and asked what I could do. And, uh, and one old man came to me and through my pigeon at Italian and so forth, he said that he had a, a, a cold chisel and a hammer and he would get the, uh, the spare off for me and get the tire off. So um, we got the spare, he got the spare off, and put it down alongside the Jeep and then half the town came and lifted the Jeep up, on, up in the air and so he could chisel off the, uh, the flat tire. Well, he got that off, and we got the spare on, got the lug nuts back on the thing, and everybody let it down, and it went down, down, because the spare was flat, too. Almost, but it was, you know, had just about enough air in it, so I could drive it. So I started down the road a little bit, because I, uh, I just had to find some place. Didn't, there were no pumps or anything like that in town. They didn't have any vehicles, you know. And uh, so th this... Italian was with me. I, I promised to take him south, and uh, and so we were starting out, and I just I could hardly steer because it was in the the front right tire that was flat, and uh, so I saw a, a vehicle coming up, and I got out of the jeep and put up my hand, and it was an ambulance with the German wounded from the night before. <laughs> they didn't want to have anything to do with me uh, at all, so they wouldn't stop. And then a truckload of Germans came up, and I tried to stop them. They did stop, but they absolutely refused to help. And uh, so I said, well, okay. So we started driving, and we started on this long hill, very slowly, and a little car started coming up this way. So I stopped the Jeep, and I got out and put my hand out, and the, the car stopped, and out came two young Germans. And much to my absolute dismay, they were SS troops, you know, with the skull and crossbones, and, and I, I said, I'm done for. I mean, <laughs> this is this is done. So, so but um, they could see my weapons, and they left their weapons in their car, and uh, so they they finally saluted, you know, the Hitler salute, and I gave them a smart salute back, and and. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to figure out how to communicate and finally realized we could all speak a little French. And so uh, we were able to communicate with French, uh, in, in French. And I showed them my tire and they said, ah, no, you know, no importa, <laughs> you know, in French. And, uh, and they went and got a pump 
and the three of us, we were all sergeants, and we all took turns pumping the, the spare tire up. And fortunately, it held air, and, uh, and they got a, a, a gauge out and checked it and said it was good and so forth. And when uh, one was pumping, the other two of us sat on a stone wall and just talked about the world and about how fortunate we were that we were still alive and the war was over with and uh, and I you know I all of a sudden uh, lost my hatred of these people and I, I don't know why I, uh, but uh, I thought you know they're just as happy as I am that this thing is over with even though they lost they wanted all the news that I could give them and so forth and and so uh, finally the uh, uh, we got everything done and we we said goodbye and saluted each other again and I went on my way, went back to Trento and got on the proper road and got into Riva finally and uh, and delivered the message to my boss who was the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Irvin, the G3, and he, obviously he took it to the general. Now, that was the end of my story, but there's a marvelous sequel to this which has never been told and, and Colonel Bill Gall, an artillery colonel, has the sequel, because I was telling Bill about this at lunch one time, Jane and I were with Bill and, and another lady, and, uh, and, and he said, did you deliver that message? And I said, yes, Bill, I did. And, and he said, do you know what was in it? I said, no, I haven't the slightest idea what was in that message. And he said, well, I do. And he said, what happened was that General Ruffner was very concerned. He wasn't making much headway. He was very concerned that he might be taken prisoner. And he, he wanted some help. And, uh, and so, uh, so uh, uh, Bill, uh, Colonel Gall said, he was a lieutenant colonel at that time, and he said, I was uh, given instructions to get uh, artillerymen together, and we got another uh, battalion commander and got his uh, infantry battalion all ready to head up north when, when uh, uh, finally uh, uh, General Ruffner appeared. He had managed to accomplish something or other, but uh, Bill said they were all ready to go up and start a battle all over again. <laughs> so I wish he would tell that, that sequel himself because uh, it, it must be a wonderful story of what he had to do, you know. Isn't it nice to know that you and Ruffner felt the same? I pray that he'd be taken prisoner. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good well, story. Well, I was just scared, Steph. Yeah, I have written this story up. I, I kept it bottled up for, for about 58 years, 55 years, and, and then I finally wrote it up, And because uh, I'm a freelance writer, see, and I wrote it up, and I sent it to John Embry, and John said, oh, that's a wonderful story. I sent it to, to Jim Barr, and, and he thought that was the greatest uh, post-war story he ever heard, and so um, uh, I had a lot more in it than I gave you here, you know, because what it came from was a letter that I wrote to my mother and father immediately, that, and to Jane, immediately that I got back to the uh, to our headquarters. As soon as I got back, I wrote this all up because I, I knew that this would be a memorable thing, and, uh, you know, 50 miles behind the German lines is just no fun whatsoever, even though I, I figured somebody, some of them have got to know that, uh, that this that the uh, that there is no such thing as a ceasefire and they're going to see me <laughs> decide that I, it's not a very good thing for me to be where I was. So at any rate, that was, um, uh, as far as a memorable occasion, that was it. There were a million of them, of course, but, but you know, even though that was after the fighting had stopped, it was some an incredibly memorable uh, happenstance. Okay? Not at all. I'm delighted to. Yeah. Okay.